Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Baptist Church. I'm, I'm glad y'all's car started this morning. Mine was kind of iffy. Um, welcome and announcements for today. Um, Barb West would like to thank everyone who had who helped out with the luncheon last week. Um, made it go very smoothly, and, and it was the help was very much appreciated. Wednesday, Seeking God Together meets at 11 a.m. via Zoom, and the Missions and Outreach Committee will meet at the church at 7 p.m. Thursday, the Interfaith Council will have a Zoom meeting beginning at noon, and also on Thursday at 7 p.m. there's choir practice here at the, here at the church. There's a new cancer support group that will start meeting on Monday on February 7th at 3 p.m. And where will that be? In the vestry. In the vestry. And we're calling it Okay. Okay. Barb says that the cancer support group is being called Uplift for helping to lift each other up. And it's going to meet in the vestry Monday, February 7th at 3 p.m. Happy birthday to Rosemary Hall on Thursday and to Dottie Sunquist and Lisa Towsley on Saturday. And thank you, Lisa, for bringing flowers for worship today. Uh, my name is Yvonne Lodico, and I'm the founder of a nonprofit called Grace Initiative Global. The GRACE stands for Governance, Reconciliation, Agriculture, and Coexistence. But of course, it's the notion of grace is kind of underscored, like that's our goal. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> previously, I worked with the United Nations and five peacekeeping missions. And so our emphasis is on peace building, inclusive, and most of the people associated with Grace Initiative have worked with the United Nations or the State Department. So everyone has relevant experience and significant experience. Um, in one of our projects that we are working on now, um, and we hope that it's implemented, is something called um, for the Afghan refugees. I know there's, it's not the first time people have heard this discussion, but um, our pilot project is um, really for the Manchester Dorset area, although it's in Bennington County, obviously. And we were first, we were um, approached by Episcopal Migrant Ministries. And so we, will, we are working directly to, with them and they are one of the nine agencies of the State Department Office for Refugee and Resettlement. As you know, the um, Brattleboro Group is associated with a group called the Ethiopian Community Development Council, and they are one of the nine um, agencies or partners of the State Department. And so only one of those nine can you deal with. You can't just say, I would like to have the Afghan refugees. And so we have had a process of them evaluating Grace Initiative, our 501c3 status, and they give a lot of guidelines of how, how we should proceed. Um, one of those, of course, is to have community engagement and to inform the community and include the community. On Thursday, last Thursday, we had a community engagement, a Zoom one, of course, uh, with the two town halls, Manchester and Dorset, the schools and um, other relevant professionals. Uh, Lisa Capitan Friedman um, was the one who actually told, suggested I come here and told me what a great place it was. And I think she also participated in the Zoom. Um, so with the step, first we were expecting to have refugees, where they're not um, come in the middle of March. And now we heard that they may be coming in the middle of February. So we're kind of fast tracking this process and, um, and we don't know how many, <laughs> but we're coordinating and letting everyone know we want to uh, make sure this is like a welcoming um, experience and we'll maybe have various community dinners. Um, we're not working with any, even though we are associated with Episcopal migrant ministries, we are not, we are very ecumenical and interfaith because obviously the refugees will all be Muslim. So to that extent, we are going to, anyone who's working on the um, 
the process or the implementation. We will sort of give an overview, if you can, on Islam and give everyone a Quran. <laughs> Not that you'll be able to read the whole thing, maybe, but at least it kind of gives people an idea if you've never dealt with Islam or Sunni Shia Islam. But I don't think they'll be very religious from, the, from what we've learned from some other groups that have already started to resettle the refugees. Um, I'm not sure if there's what else, but, you know, I, I was just... Uh, speaking very briefly to um, the Minister Summons, uh, Ambassador Summons. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, she has a really great experience internationally as well, working in development, so I'm very honored to be here. Um, you know, we don't know. Was, this is a great pilot project for us, and we can learn more about other people's humanity, but Maybe there'll be other refugees who will come later from Afghanistan. Maybe there'll be another crisis or climate change crisis. But we are kind of learning how to embrace the other and kind of follow this notion of grace with others. So um, we have some um, leaflets that, uh, that Lisa has kindly printed out. And so, and um, Pastor Summons is going to um, anyone who is interested, they can speak with her and we can coordinate. We will be setting up a separate web page for this later and that's all I really had to say. So thank you so much for your time. So I, like, I like to go through old books because old books aren't necessarily out of date. This is titled Uncommon Prayers and the original owner, some of you may know, Marguerite Havey and she received it from someone in 1955. So, um, and we'll go even farther back. What I found in here for a word of preparation today is from an old serum primer in 1558. Serum is um, Salisbury, England, and a lot of ecclesiastical stuff came out of there. So anyway, this is the word of preparation. God, be in my head and in my understanding God, be in my eyes and in my looking. God, be in my mouth and in my speaking. God, be in my heart and in my thinking. God, be at my end and at my departing. faith will stand and I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine waters your sovereign hand will be my guide where feet may fail and fear surrounds me you've never failed and you won't start now and I will call upon your name my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine 
Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. And I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. For I am yours, and you are mine. O oh God, come to us, we pray thee, with the resources of thy power, that we may be strong again. We ask not for easy lives, but for adequacy. We ask not to be freed from storms, but to build our houses on rock that will not fall. We pray not for a smooth sea, but for a stout ship, a good compass, and a strong heart. In the name of him who faced enmity and death without flinching, our Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Praise. But 
when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, you give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away, you give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Amen. We're going to be continuing in our, our series through Philippians this morning with, with the question, how is God using this trial? When trials come into our lives, the first question that usually rises in many of us is, why? Why did the accident happen? Why do I have this disease? Why am I feeling stuck here in this situation? And sometimes, we can get a, a little bit of a glimmer of insight about those why questions. Um, Matthew West kind of grappled with these questions. What is the meaning of all this hard circumstance in, in our lives in his song called The Reason for the World? I'll share some of the lyrics with you. He wrote, there are no words in times like these when tears don't hide the tragedies and all you want is a reason for the world. No comfort in the greeting card, because God is good, but life's still hard. And your heart just wants a reason for the world. But maybe the reason for the pain is so that we would pray for strength. And maybe the reason for the strength is so that we would not lose hope. And maybe the reason for all hope is so that we could face the world and the reason for the world is to make us long for home. For God so loved your broken heart, he sent his son to where you are, and he died to give a reason for the world. So lift your sorrows to the one whose plan for you has just begun, and rest here in the hands that hold the world. I know you're past the point of broken, surrounded by your fear, I know you're faint and tired and lonely from the road that you walked down here. But just keep your eyes on heaven and know that you're not alone. Remember the reason for the world. No eye has heard, no ear has, no ear has heard, no eye has seen, not even in your wildest dreams, the beauty that awaits beyond this world. When you look into the eyes of grace, and hear the mercy voice say, child, welcome to the reason for the world. Matthew West believes that the trials of this life can only be understood when we embrace a larger and internal perspective of life. And I think that the Apostle Paul would agree. He was enduring so many trials, including the one he's going through right at the time when this letter is being written. He's a prisoner, and he's chained to Roman guards. His friends in Philippi are concerned about him, so in the next part of this letter, he's going to let them know how he's doing and what he thinks about his situation and how he can see God at work, even using this trial for eternal purposes. So let's listen as John reads to us this morning Philippians 1, 12-20. So we can learn how Paul held on to an eternal perspective and how we can do the same in our trials. 
is uh, Philippians 1, verses 12 through 20. I want you to know, dear ones, what has happened to me has not hindered but helped my ministry of preaching the gospel, causing it to expand and spread to many people. For now, the elite Roman guards and government officials overseeing my imprisonment have plainly recognized that I am here because of my love for the anointed one. And what I am going through has actually caused many believers to become even more courageous in the Lord and to be bold and passionate to preach the word of God, all because of my chains. It's true that there are some who preach Christ out of competition and controversy, for they are jealous over the way God has used me. Many others have purer motives. They preach with grace and love filling their hearts because they know I've been destined for the purpose of defending the revelation of God. Those who preach Christ with ambition and competition are insincere. They just want to add to the hardships of my imprisonment. Yet in spite of all this, I am overjoyed. For what does it matter as long as Christ is being preached? If they preach him with mixed motives or with genuine love, the message of Christ is still being preached. And I will continue to rejoice because I know that the lavish supply of the Spirit of Jesus, the Anointed One, and your intercession for me will bring about my deliverance. No matter what, I will continue to hope and passionately cling to Christ so that he will be openly revealed through me before everyone's eyes, so I will not be ashamed in my life or in my death. Christ will be magnified in me. So how does Paul say he's doing? I'm going to start out with his emotional state because trials have a way of stirring up our emotions. Sometimes they break on us so suddenly we are just stuck in a, a state of shock at the beginning. Or then we might feel sad or scared or angry, or confused, and frustrated, and exhausted, and overwhelmed. Paul might have felt all of these emotions at the beginning of his imprisonment. We don't know. But at the time of the writing, he describes himself as being overjoyed and hopeful. So how is that possible? I imagine that for a person as driven as Paul to have all his plans brought to a halt really gave him time to sit with his emotions and thoughts, to express them to God, and to let God kind of reframe his thinking to be able to see the positive things in the midst of the hard things. So at this point, when this is being written, Paul is choosing to focus on the thing that is most important to him. It's not building an impressive reputation so everyone will always remember him. It's not living a long and trouble-free life. It's fulfilling his life purpose, which he describes as having Christ openly revealed through him before everyone's eyes. He wants to be faithful to the end of his life, however long God might keep him here on earth. He's received a call to share the gospel, and as long as that's getting done, Paul accepts the circumstances and trusts that God sees a bigger picture. Are we willing to be honest with God about our darker feelings and wonderings? To express them, but then also to have an openness to letting God reframe our situation so we can start to see the light of God shining and begin to experience the hope and joy that Paul felt, too. I read about three Ethiopian men in a publication called The Voice of the Martyrs, and at the beginning of their story, there was a lot of darkness dominating, but God brought light into their lives and transformed them and the view of their situation. The article was called finding their eternal home in prison. Nagasi went to prison because he was hired to cast a spell to try to change the mind of another man's sister. 
But when the man came back several months later with his sister, Nagasi had failed to buy the items necessary for the spell. He wasn't ready to receive her and help her. And so the man was very angry and he filed charges. So Nagasi went to jail. His sentence was three years and 10 months. In jail, he had a long time to think and he began to search for a way to clear his conscience. And he began reading a Bible that he found and he, he learned a lot from the Gospels. He came to a conviction that salvation could only be found through Christ alone. And he was really excited about this discovery. He, he began telling other people in prison this amazing truth that he had found out. They weren't super happy to hear this. <laughs> so he, it landed him in shackles for a time, just like the Apostle Paul. And then eventually he was returned to minimum security and he met another person named Ephraim who was in jail for the same kind of offense as Nagasi. He had received payment to practice black magic services, but he hadn't followed through. So at first Ephraim was resisting what Nagasi was trying to tell him and he even reported Nagasi to the guards. But eventually, he began to study his Bible on his own, and he came to faith in Jesus because he found out that uh, John 14 described him as the way, the truth, and the life, and that just really took root in his life. So then Nagasi and Ephraim became close friends, and they encouraged each other, especially when the guards were mistreating them. A third man named Dana was chosen to bring food to Nagasi when he was once again in solitary confinement. And he noticed that Nagasi had a sense of contentment and grace, even in the pitch blackness of his cell. And he wanted to have what Nagasi and Ephraim had. And although he was anxious, because he didn't want to get persecuted, Dana became a believer in Jesus. And all three of these men began to grow in faith and in boldness to share the gospel with other prisoners. So by the time they were all released, 15 other people had come to faith. And then Nagasi, Ephraim, and, and Danat learned that it was actually even harder to follow Christ in northern Ethiopia outside of prison than inside. So when he got home, Nagasi's wife divorced him and took their daughter far away because she didn't like that he had become a Christian. And Dana, when he went back to his um, family, had his, the people in his village who didn't like him becoming a Christian tried to lo lock his whole family inside of the house and burn it down. But God had provided for them because Dana was not in the house. He was in a field tending a cow so he could come and, and rescue his wife and daughter, but they lost their house. But this is what he had to say about it. Dana said, our real home is in heaven. They only burned my earthly house. So my heart is not full of hatred and I pray for them. And when he was asked why he would choose to build another home in the same village, he answered, my life belongs to God and I believe he put me here. I don't know why he wants me to stay here, but I believe he's working. If he allows me to be killed, I am ready to die. And if he wants to save the entire village, then I just have to be patient. Nagasi is now studying to be a pastor. He decided he was going to pay back all the money that he owed to the man who, who filed charges against him. And now they're friends. And Nagasi tells him, you are my everlasting good person because you put me in prison. I will not forget you because you helped me find eternal life. Like Paul, these men are choosing to rejoice in the midst of their trials and to hold on to hope and to passionately cling to Christ so that whether in life or death, Christ is magnified in them. Their hearts are firmly tethered to eternity and God has put in each person a longing, a desire, a space for eternity so that we would search for it and we would find it in him as they have done. Their faith and their eternal perspective keeps them from being overwhelmed and shut down by the emotions that they surely had, but 
they could have kept them trapped in bitterness their life long. They could see how God was working in the midst of their trials to bring both them and then other people into relationship with God. The Apostle Paul could also see how God was working in his trials to bring people to saving knowledge of Christ. And that's what he shares in verses 12 to 14. He writes, What has happened to me has not hindered, but helped my ministry of preaching the gospel, causing it to expand and spread to many people. Even though he was in a waiting place, unable to travel around, he couldn't go where he had planned to go, Paul came to peace by seeing that God had given more people the call to share the gospel. And he had still people in his life. He looked around and saw them as an opportunity. He might have been the prisoner, but he sees the elite Roman guards that he's chained to as his captive audience. So he has a chance to speak about Jesus and the love of God and the forgiveness available to all people in front of many different soldiers as they take their turn being chained to the Apostle Paul. Even the government officials that served Caesar knew about Paul and his faith precisely because he is being held before his trial. Paul says of this, they have plainly recognized that I am here because of my love for the anointed one. He has this motivation to demonstrate the love of God and the character qualities of Christ because he's an ambassador to the whole of Rome being even in prison. Do we ask God to help us see where he's working and what unique opportunity our trial holds? God is often working inside of us during our trials to help draw us closer to God and to grow our trust and our character and mature our faith. But trials aren't just for us and for our personal growth. They're also for the others. And we meet people through our troubles that we might not have been in contact with, like Paul did. Every encounter with another person is an opportunity for God's love and truth to be shared. I finally I finished my book, Start With Amen, and I brought it in case anyone wants to read it next, but I'll share just one more story from Beth Guckenberger. This one is about her work in finding a uh, home for difficult to place children in Mexico. She had just moved from Mexico after living there for 10 years to a home in the United States. But now in this time, she had flown back to Mexico to meet with children who had medical conditions or traumatic backgrounds. The last person on the list was an 11-year-old boy. And she looked at that and she knew his age alone would make him difficult to place. And then he walked into the room and their eyes met, and she felt the Holy Spirit just stir in her heart, and she was wondering what would happen next. Well, the boy had questions about life in America. He wanted to know about snow, and he said, is it true that in America, pets have their own beds? <laughs> then he said, I guess what I'm really wondering is, I have never seen a happy adoptive family. My question is, have you? And Beth pulled out pictures of her own family and her brother's family who had just been at a, a wedding together and they're laughing and they're making faces and they have a variety of skin tones. Some of them are from the US, some from Mexico, some from Ethiopia, but they're all smiling and laughing together. And she said, it's not bloodlines that make a family. Love is what makes a family. And he said, find me a family like that. And she tried when she got back to the States. She, she tried to plead his case with different people that she knew, but she couldn't find a family who was willing to take this little guy. And then one day her husband came in from a run and said, Beth, I can't stop thinking about that boy. He's sitting in an orphanage while we're here with all of this. And Beth burst into tears saying, I know, I know, I'm afraid, 
but I know, yes, <laughs> I think this might have been their 10th <laughs> they, of kids of various sources that they have incorporated into their family. So they talked to the children that they had and everyone agreed to make Tyler part of the family. Six months of paperwork later, it was finally time to let Tyler know that he had a family. So Beth flew to Mexico and sat down in the room with Tyler to tell him the good news. And she says, I have a family for you. It's me. I'm going to be your mama. And she thought he would be excited and maybe like smile or hug him, or hug her or something. But instead he like doubled over and put his head between his knees and was like struggling to breathe. And she was wondering what he was thinking. So the psychologist came in and asked Tyler, just one word, what is this feeling that you're having? And he said, allegria, which means total joy. So, there was more waiting for everyone while the adoption needed finalizing, and setbacks and delays would regularly discourage them. But in their Skype conversations, Beth and Todd would always remind Tyler what was true. They would end every conversation saying, you are our son, we are coming for you, and God has a plan. We might not understand it or even like it, but we're going to trust it. So when the day came that Tyler needed to appear in court, because he's now over 12, and answer the judge's question, why are you certain this adoption is in your best interest? He was shaking with nerves and just, they didn't know what he would say, but those words came back to him just when he needed them. And he told the judge, because I am their son and they came for me, God has a plan and we will trust it. Everyone in the courtroom heard those words. Maybe they even took them in. What a testimony to cling to, to know that truth. And Beth wrote, truth brings peace, and peace brings confidence. And that's what we see in the Apostle Paul as well. He knows that other people are out there spreading the gospel in ways that he cannot. Some are doing it for what he discerns are loving motives, and others are just seeking glory. They think this is their big chance to shine now that Paul's out of the way. But Paul has come to peace with what he cannot do and with what they are doing. He's not in control, but that's okay with him, because God is using both groups of people to spread the gospel, and that's enough. As for his fate, he rejoices that the Philippian believers are praying for him and that the spirit of Jesus will bring about his deliverance. Do you know that this is the only place in scripture that we read spirit of Jesus? I'm wondering maybe if Paul uses it here because he's remembering that Jesus was a prisoner too and he was brought in chains to trial. He wants to follow Jesus' example so that whether his earthly trial leads to freedom or death, he will walk in the steps of his Lord and Savior. He wants to follow that and, and have God's strength flowing through him by clinging to Christ. He knows that Paul will receive anything he needs to meet the challenge of the moment. And whether he's vindicated between Caesar, before Caesar's tribunal or not, he's more focused on the big day, the big court, the heavenly one, his appearance before the Lord. He even mentions it in a letter to Timothy. This is 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 8. And he wrote, the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith, and now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only me, but also all who have longed for his appearing. Do you hear how Paul's eyes are focused on God, and he's wanting his heart to be connected with God? That's where his focus is. I 
I was sometimes listening to Max Lucado, comes up on a little Instagram, a little word for the day, and I was like, wow, he's talking about Paul in Philippians, this passage. I thought, oh, I'm going to write down what he says. And Max Lucado said, rather, rather than count the bricks of his prison, Paul planted a garden within it. He itemized not the mistreatment of people, but the faithfulness of God. He may appear bumped off track, but he's actually right on target. The mission is being accomplished. Paul displays an absolute trust in God's oversight. The power is in God's hands, not in the situation or circumstance. And that's why Paul could write from the chill of a jail, I am happy and I will continue to be happy. He was unfairly treated, he had an uncertain future, yet he had unbridled joy. Why? Because Paul trusted God. He didn't know why the bad things happened. He didn't know how they would be resolved, but he knew who was in charge, and knowing who counterbalances the mystery of why and how. We all go through trials, some big and some small, and we might be experiencing those dark emotions, and that's not wrong. It's okay. Check out the Psalms and the laments there. But neither are those places where we want to dwell and get stuck. There's another choice, the choice that Paul made to walk through those hard emotions and thoughts and get to the place where God can shine some light into the darkness so that hope and joy can emerge. Well, God will show us what he's up to in us and what he's up to in the world. The key is to trust God, clinging to Christ and letting the spirit open our eyes to an eternal perspective. We can know that we are God's child that he's coming for us. Trust that he has a plan to bring us home, and that will enable us to have peace and confidence. As I read in one of Toby Mack's little Speak Life quotes this week, God is the one who makes it well with your soul, even when it is not well with your circumstances. Would you pray with me? Dear God, sometimes we just want to have an easy, comfortable life, and yet that is not how you've designed life here to be at this time. One day you will make things all right, and death will be defeated, and sadness and disease and darkness will be just overcome by your light and your life but it's our reality right now. So we're glad, Lord, that you have walked through it, that you continue to walk through it with us, and that you can continue to shine light and work all things for good, even when we can't quite understand what you're up to. Give us patience and help us to trust you. And Lord, would you just give us joy and peace as we really draw close to you? Thank you for making things well with our soul. In Jesus' name, amen.